Dr. Vicki T. Sapp. I am the Director for Student Engagement, Diversity and Inclusion at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. This webinar series has been made possible in part by the National Endowment for Humanities Cares Grant. Humanities in the time of COVID-19, fostering community dialogue. In conjunction, in partnership with Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine and Misericordia University. Today's speakers are Dr. Rhonda Daly and Dr. Daryl McBride. I will exit the webinar. We're glad that you decided to join us but we wanna make sure that you are aware that it will be recorded and give you the opportunity to exit if you would like to. So let's introduce our speakers today. We're so excited about them. Dr. Daly is an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health Sciences. And she also serves as the scientific officer in the Office of Community Engaged Research at Wayne State University. She has over 20 years of experience conducting qualitative and quantitative. She also has extensive expertise in community engagement and with the recruitment and retention of minority populations. Dr. Daly's research interests include the influence of race, racism on health, women's health, health equity, and disparity related to chronic disease which is primarily asthma and hypertension, patient attitudes and behaviors about health and healthcare quality. She is currently leading Oshner's efforts in delivering cultural competency workshops and is co-investigator on several R1 research studies that align with her interests, asthma and prenatal health outcomes in African-American participants. Our second speaker today is Dr. Daryl McBride. He is an attendant physician of infectious disease at Geisinger Clinic and Geisinger Health System. He also serves as a regional assistant dean for student affairs for Geisinger's Commonwealth School of Medicine. He specializes in HIV treatment, management, and prevention. He is currently on the board for the AIDS Research Center in Williamsport, PA. Dr. McBride completed his Infectious Disease Fellowship at Washington University School of Medicine, where he was named HIV Fellow in his second year and was responsible for managing the HIV population at John Cochran VA Hospital in St. Louis, Missouri. That same year, he was awarded a grant to start a prep clinic. Dr. McBride was granted an additional year of fellowship to further specialize in HIV, HCV, co-infectious management, where he was instructional and instrumental, excuse me, instrumental in providing retention in the HIV clinic. He has experienced the inner workings of a well-functioning Ryan White Clinic dedicated to expanding access to quality HIV care and pra um, practice identifying, assessing, and subsequently closing the care gaps. Dr. McBride was recently selected to be on the Ending HIV as an Epidemic Working Group, a national committee. And I would like to you all to also join me in congratulating Dr. McBride because he is, has received a Ryan White grant here for Geisinger Commonwealth um, Health System as well. It is my honor to turn over this webinar to my esteemed colleagues, Drs. Daly and McBride. But prior to doing that, again, if you've just joined us, if you would like credit, please make sure to sign in in the chat box at the beginning as well as at the end. This is being recorded. If you do not want to be recorded, please feel free to part the webinar at this time. Thank you so much, Drs. Daly and McBride. Hello. Um, so uh, please advance the next slide. Thank you. Uh, this is our agenda, as you can see. Um, 
advance the next slide, please. So uh, here's our over, overview. So we took some liberties and are gonna uh, pre present it in a particular way that we feel really explains what we're trying to um, discuss here. So as you can see, we'll start with definitions, um, but they will be presented throughout the presentation. Um, trauma, uh, history, uh, we'll talk about historical trauma. We're talking about discrimination or redlining, medical experimentation, bias, implicit bias, racism and microaggressions. We'll talk about disparities in daily life, talk about post-traumatic stress disorder and social uh, determinants of health, and also uh, discuss uh, declarations regarding uh, racism as a public health crisis. We'll, we'll have an activity and we'll talk about uh, practical implications and how to really work through some of the issues that we will discuss. Next slide. Um, some of our learning objectives here, okay? So we will define uh, the term generational trauma and its application to uh, health ethics and medical practice. We'll try to understand the ways in which generational trauma has affected vulnerable populations and the ramifications of current medical practice and public policy. And we'll examine the ways in which marginalized cultures have been subjected to unethical medical practices under the guise of scientific progress. Next slide. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Daly, take it away. Thank you, Dr. McBride. And thank you, um, Dr. Sapp for that wonderful introduction and, um, and telling our backgrounds a little bit. So today, um, and I have the pleasure of presenting with Dr. McBride today. Um, I, uh, I'm looking forward to this presentation. So we're gonna talk about historical trauma right now. And I want to warn you that some of the images shown in this presentation may contain some graphic material. So viewer discretion is advised. So trauma, the definition of trauma is the response to a deeply distressing or disturbing event that overwhelms an individual's ability to cope. It causes feelings of hopelessness and it just diminishes their, their, their um, sense of self and their ability to feel the full range of emotions and experiences. So generational trauma, also known as transgenerational or intergenerational tra trauma, is the um, this is where the transference of trauma to subsequent um, generations occur. This can be silent, covert, and un undefined, surfacing through nuances and inadvertently taught or implied throughout someone's life from an early age onward. So I want to ask the audience questions, just a, a quick question. Who is vulnerable to generational trauma? Who do you think is vulnerable to it? And we can just add that to um, the chat box if we want. Um, anyone? So yeah, I did see someone wrote anyone. Perfect, perfect. So Everyone is vulnerable to generational trauma, especially those affected by hate crimes, domestic violence, sexual assault, abuse, um, also poverty, catastrophes, or wars. The example of this place, examples that we have are, uh, for example, the displacement of the American Indians uh, uh, during the Trail of Tears, also Holocaust survivors, the Holodomor survivors in Ukraine. Um, the Khmer Rouge killings in Cambodia, and also Rwandan genocide, and of course, the enslavement of African-Americans, which we're gonna expound on in a few um, slides. So signs of trauma are sadness, anger, denier, denial, fear, and shame. And it leads to insomnia, nightmares, difficulty with relationships and emotional trauma. And also physical symptoms of trauma uh, occur, such as altered sleep patterns, nausea, GI problems, headaches, loss of appetite, and also some associated psychological disorders like depression, anxiety, dissociative disorders, and also substance abuse problems and post-traumatic stress disorder. So the generational effects of trauma are sometimes fear-based survival messages are passed along, like don't ask for help, it's dangerous. There's a fear of dis personal disclosure, distrust with healthcare providers, and also a lack of family communication that's involved with trauma. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of um, information, a historical background on how some 
trauma has started for African Americans here in the United States. So this is Africa. It's a continent and not a country. It's made of 54 countries. It was never a dark place of uncivilized, uncultured, um, uncultured people. It's rich in history, natural resources, and all the first came from here. That means the origin of man, um, language, math, science, it all came from Africa. It's called the cradle of civilization. And it suffered from colonialism. And yes, there were interwars like the slave system, rival tribes, and these rival tribes mostly um, committed crimes against each other. And that slave system involved people who committed crimes against each other, but it was nothing like the generational chattel slavery that was here in America. So this is a picture of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, also called the Middle Passage. And I just wanted to let you see where most of the people came from. So the Caribbean and South of Africa, America received 95% of the slaves arriving in America. Some captives disembarked in Africa rather than Americans because of their transatlantic voyage, um, which, 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 which was diverted um, as a result of slave rebellion or during the area of suppression. And let me let you see that. Um, because of the capture of patrolling naval cruisers. Less than 4% disembarked in North America and just only and just over 10,000 in Europe. And um, there were over 41,000 voyages between 1514 and 1866 containing 12.5 million um, captives from Africa to the Americans. So 10.7 survived. Um, and they were um, shipped to either North or South America. And for the most part, um, Brazil received 42% of, of the enslaved, Jamaica 11%, and again, US just 4%. So um, the Portuguese, Spanish, English, French, and Dutch were all involved. So this was the largest transoceanogenic migration of people until until it and it provided Americans with a crucial labor force for their own economic development. The slave trade is thus a vital part of history of some millions of Africans and their descendants who helped shape the modern Americas culturally and economically. So this is a picture of the um, the packed slave ship called Brooks. Okay, the Brooks carried over 600 enslaved Africans. And the imprint shows only 482 people, but overcrowding was very common. Each person had only 16 inches wide to lie in, and they could neither sit or stand. Enslaved men, women, and children were, were packed in the hole of the, for a six to eight week journey. And imagine what it felt like to be chained in the belly of a ship with only 16 inches between you where, you, where you slept, where you wept, where you ate, where you defecated, where you urinated, where you menstruated, where you vomited, where you gave birth, and where you died. So a lot of Africans have resisted um, enslaving in front of point of capture. And it's often not mentioned that there are many slave revolts um, on the ships and thousands um, tried to flee once they were on land. So the enslaved people tried to run away after being captured by slave traders, thus the heavy iron collar that was placed on them to inflict punishment. Other um, punishment devices included muzzles or iron masks placed on them to inflict um, punishment. And other um, um, devices included, um, again, this long cord you see here, Hello, am I still on? Sorry. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I didn't see anything. I'm oh, oh, sorry. So this is a picture of Gordon, who's um, who's also called Whip Peter. He's a runaway slave. And in 1883, he successfully ran away from a 3,000 acre plantation um, in Louisiana. Um, he was um, he ran away and joined the um, the union and got captured again and ran away again. And um, the reason why this is so important is that this is the first picture that went viral because it was distributed naturally, I mean, nationally and internationally free. 
So by the way, slaves were not allowed to read or write and they would be severely punished if they did so. So African-Americans who participated in every war fought on our, participated in every war fought by or within the United States. And this includes the Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Mexican-American War, the Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam War, Gulf War, and the wars of Afghanistan and Iraq, as well as other minor conflicts. However, when these brave and honorable soldiers came home, they fought a more gruesome systematic um, war, which was racism. They risked lynching and being burned by the mob for minor reasons, like looking at a white, looking to a white man. So between, uh, this is 17-year-old um, um, Jesse Washington's burnt corpse, who was uh, the chief suspect in the murder of a woman who he, who he worked as a laborer in front of over, I'm sorry, I did that, in front of over 10,000 spectators after lynching, he was placed in a burlap bag, dragged down the city hall plaza through the main streets of Waco, Texas, and seven miles to Robinson, where a large black population resided. Um, his charred corpse was hung for public display in front of a blacksmith shop. Postcards were made and burned body parts were handed out as part of memorabilia. So between 1882 and 1968, an estimated um, 4,742 Blacks met their deaths at the hand of lynch mobs. So slaves performed all kinds of jobs within the United States of America. They worked on plantations and in towns and on various um, kinds of occupations where they were skilled, semi-skilled or unskilled. The slave labor helped to build the United States into the great country it is today. And slave African labor was necessary for the survival of the European colonial economies in the Americas from the 16th through the 19th century. And historians have dis discovered that the slaves worked for 12 hour days, six days a week on construction of the Capitol. And also the brass statue of freedom was placed through the efforts of Philip Reed, a former slave. This is what the brass statue is located in the Capitol building. So um, also the American civil rights movement had many aims, but one of the central goals of peaceful nonviolent marches and demonstrations was to expose those who opposed equality and freedom for what they truly were, hateful, mean-spirited bigots. Now, this is the mutilated body uh, of Emmett Till, right here at the top, um, from Chicago, who was falsely accused of whistling at, at a white woman in Mississippi. He was beaten and shot in the head by, um, by her husband and brother-in-law. No one was convicted. Till's murder and open casket funeral galvanized the emerging civil rights movement. And this is the, um, right here in the middle is a famous US representative of Georgia, John Lewis, who sustained a fractured skull from a blow to a police officer, by a police officer in this picture. Uh, and this is from the famous civil rights march in, 19, in the March of 1965, the Bloody Sunday. So after crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Sorry, it seems like we lost Dr. Daly. Yeah. I'm gonna see if we can get her back. Thank you so much. For those of you who did not sign in as of yet, please make sure you do that if you want continuing education credit. Also, if you can all turn off your videos, make sure that your mics are muted so that the facilitators do not lose connectivity. That would be great. Thank you all so much for coming. We appreciate that. I am in communication with Dr. Daly via phone right now. And so we should have her back up shortly. She's back on with us. Thank you so much for being patient. Sorry about that. Something weird just happened. Um, I don't know. I think it was a Zoom thing now. Um, on my end, and I my apologies. Let me get my slides back up, and we can continue on. Um, again, I apologize for this. Thank you so much, Dr. Daly. Glad yeah. to have you back. Thank you. 
I'm not sure. Oh, let me show my screen first. Um, that would be helpful, wouldn't it be? All right, share. Perfect. Okay, can you see my screen? Perfect. Yeah. All right, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Okay, so I wanted to talk about redlining. And after the Great Depression in the, the late 1930s, the Federal Government's Homeowners Loan Corporation, or the HOLC, HOLC, graded neighborhoods in four categories based on the racial makeup to reflect their mortgage security. And neighborhoods where working class, where working class whites and also immigrants and especially black people um, uh, where they live were rated D and marked in red, hence redlining. And so this is the city of Detroit. Um, and the, these areas were considered hazardous and ineligible for FHA back, backing. So the red line is spread to the entire mortgage industry, including black people from, uh, and it excluded black people from obtaining mortgages and home ownership. And it severely affected the opportunity of building generational wealth, which has uh, lasted up until today. And this is images from um, the Mapping Inequality, uh, which is located online. So it's a great resource for people. All right. And I'm going to now um, hand this over to my, um, my colleague, Dr. McBride. Hello. So um, I'm going to talk about discrimination. Discrimination is the unequal allocation of goods, resources, and services and the limitation of access to full participation in society based on individual participation, um, uh, membership in a particular social group. So this is reinforced by law, policy, cultural norms that allow for differential treatment on the basis of identity. Social power or privilege is the access to resources that enhances one's choices um, uh, to getting what one needs in order to lead a comfortable, productive, and safe life. So the, uh, uh, the uh, positive of, uh, or the negative of uh, discrimination plus um, the positive of social power leads to oppression. Um, oppression is when an agent group, whether knowingly or unknowingly, abuses a target system. Uh, this pervasive system is rooted historically and maintained through individual and institutional slash uh, systemic racism, personal bias, bigotry, social prejudice, um, resulting in a condition of privilege for an agent group uh, at the expense of the target group. Um, so this is very pow powerful. When you see certain things in action, um, you can definitely see um, how discrimination plus privilege really leads to a systematic oppression and that affects every aspect of life. Next slide. <laughs> uh, so now I'll talk about medical mistrust, particularly regarding the Tuskegee experiment. Next slide. Um, so the Tuskegee experiment, this uh, uh, began from 1932 and uh, ended in 1972. Uh, at the time, there was no known treatment for syphilis. After being recruited with the promise of free medical care, 600 men originally were enrolled in this project. The participants were mainly sharecroppers from Macon County, Alabama, and many of them never had, uh, never seen a doctor before at the time. Next slide. Uh, so the doctors were from the US Public Health Services. Again, this is um, a government agency, um, which was running the study. Um, and uh, the participants were broken into, uh, up into two groups. Three, uh, 399 men were diagnosed with latent syphilis and 201 men were uh, uh, found to be disease free and they were the control group. Uh, PHS worked with Tuskegee, uh, the Tuskegee University, a historical black university in Al Alabama to help enroll this study. Uh, and they were told initially that they were being treated for bad blood, which is again, a non-specific term uh, that really describes a bunch of ailments. So the um, participants were not really informed of what this was about or really what they were being treated for. The men were monitored by healthcare workers, but only given placebos, okay? Despite the fact that penicillin became the recommended uh, treatment for syphilis in 1947. Uh, the PHS researchers convinced local physicians in Macon County to not treat the participants. 
which in a number of ways is unethical, and uh, in order to track the full diseases process, so uh, progress. So really they asked, they said, hey, we want to know more about syphilis. Can you, you know, restrict treatment so we can see full progression? Um, so uh, as a result, uh, the men either died, went blind, went insane, or experienced uh, other severe health problems due to untreated syphilis. By the 1972, 28 per uh, participants had died from syphilis. 100 more passed away from uh, re related complications. At least 40 spouses were diagnosed with syphilis, as well as 19 children were born with congenital syphilis. And again, this is a project that was sanctioned by the US government. Um, next, I'll talk about uh, Henrietta Lacks. Uh, in 1951, she's an she was an African-American woman um, uh, who was diagnosed with terminal cervical cancer. She died at the age of 31, very young. Next part. Uh, she was treated at Johns Hopkins University um, by Dr. Uh, George Gay, um, who collected herself uh, without informing her or the family. Uh, Gay discovered that the uh, lax cells could actually be kept alive and would also grow indefinitely. Uh, lax cells, um, also known as HeLa cells, um, have been used in experiments ranging from the effects of long-term radiation um, to the testing of the polio vaccine. And Lack's family, however, did not know uh, the cell cultures existed until more than 20 years after her death. So medical mistrust is something that's really, really important, particularly as we advance um, in our uh, medical application. So um, medical, uh, medical trust, that is. So medical mistrust um, is the tendency to distrust institutions of uh, medicine, including personal and uh, personnel and clinicians who represent the dominant culture as a result of the past and present discrimination and, and racial uh, prosecution that we just showed you. Um, med many medical conspiracies have evolved that uh, really discourage um, minorities from engaging in, in medical care and the medical system in general. Um, these th uh, uh, theories further perpetuate medical mistrust. Um, and again, as we advance more in medical technology, trust becomes essential. Um, it's, it becomes much harder to discuss clinical diagnoses with patients, to have patients understand. Um, even from a literacy standpoint, you know, with the addition of medical uh, literacy, it really becomes um, really difficult to really explain truly in depth what's going on with a uh, patient's disease process and what they have to take for treatment. And so, you know, if it, trust becomes a foundation on which our health system is built and managed and maintained. Uh, given that patients are often in vulnerable positions, the lack of trust can lead to very poor outcomes. And the presence of medical mistrust in the African-American community uh, with a mixture of historical events, some of which we've shown already, um, continued uh, personal experiences and the complex interplay of these two issues, in addition to other so social economic factors, really make a, a, a bad juju for the entire experience. I will uh, continue here. Um, so next slide. All right. So I will discuss racism. So racism is a belief that a race is inherently more superior than another race. It involves many things, the oppression of one race by a dominant race, uh, the power of the dominant race to impact the non-dominant race as an entire group, and it ranges from ambiguous microaggressions to blatant hate crimes and physical assault. The effects of racism and discrimination um, are, you know, uh, multidimensional. Uh, race matters uh, profoundly for health. Uh, blacks and minorities receive poorer quality of care um, than whites due to implicit biases, um, which lead to discrimination against that group. Higher levels of discrimination um, really lead to increased risk for a broad range of diseases, um, including heart disease, premature uh, birth, uh, cancer, hypertension, and COVID-19. Uh, teenagers who reported higher levels of discrimination had higher levels of stress hormones, 
um, higher weight, uh, more weight gain, and um, uh, higher blood pressure at the age of 20. At every level of education, white lives longer, uh, whites live longer than blacks do. And racial discrimination leads to racial segregation. Where you live really matters. Uh, so if you could eliminate residential segregation statistically, redlining as previously, previously explained by the fantastic Dr. Daly, uh, you would uh, completely erase black white differences in income, education, and uh, unemployment. And this would reduce white black differences in single motherhood by two thirds. Bias uh, is, the, uh, is prejudice in favor of or against one thing, person or group, compared with another, usually in a way um, that's considered to be unfair. Um, it can cause you to feel or show inclination or prejudice for or against someone or something. A bias may be favorable or unfavorable. You may be biased in favor of or against an idea. Next slide. Um, implicit bias really refers to um, the attitudes and stereotypes that affect our understanding actions and decisions in an unconscious way. Um, these can be favorable or unfavorable. Um, uh, this can be activated involuntarily and without an individual's awareness or intentional control. This is a learned behavior and everyone has them. Um, an example would be favoring people who look like you. Right. And lastly is microaggressions. Um, so, you know, this is brief, commonplace, daily, everyday verbal, nonverbal, environmental slights, snubs, and insults, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or like uh, negative messages, uh, especially toward minorities in race, gender, or sexual orientation, et cetera. When experiencing them, the target loses vital mental resources trying to figure out um, the intention of the one who's committing the act. Uh, racism and microaggressions, um, they happen frequently and particularly in today's society. Um, it allows for um, the person afflicted to become anxiety promoting. Uh, they are very anxiety promoting um, and they are often dismissed um, by others and very overwhelming. Um, uh, it sends, uh, it makes the person being afflicted by these constantly vigilant and uh, they gain a certain paranoia and that leads to traumatization and contributes to post-traumatic stress disorder. Disparities are important um, uh, to talk about and uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Daly will talk about this uh, really briefly, um, but it's really discrimination stress, racism, um, and they're experienced by many ethnic racial groups, including immigrants, uh, social, uh, sexual minorities, uh, disabled people, and other stigmatized groups. So when you combine everything together, this leads to disparity. It's the disproportionately, disproportionately uh, affects Blacks from the cradle to the grave, physically, psychologically, economically, environmentally, socially, and, and has a very large educational impact. These, disparity, uh, these disparities, again, will be presented on the next slides. Thank you, Dr. McBride, for that lovely overview. So we're gonna talk about um, disparities in justice now. So I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna get, provide you at least three examples of where uh, disparities in justice is really, really stark. So uh, here are Shanisa, Shanisa Taylor and Catalina Klauser. So both of them um, left their children in the car. So uh, Shanisa is homeless. She's an Arizona woman who, um, who went to a job interview while her two month old and six year old waited in the car and she was taken to jail and her, she, was, she was sent to jail and her children taken away. And Catalina, um, she was an Arizona mother who, um, who um, got high and drove 12 miles with her two-month-old on top of the car until the child fell off. And she got probation. So both of these um, men um, killed four people while driving under the influence. One received 10 years probation and the other was sentenced to prison for life. And I do remember 
um, uh, the one that, that was um, got the 10 year probation because his um, lawyer used the word affluenza to um, kind of um, provide some type of excuse of the reason why um, he committed those crimes. These are two college athletes who raped um, unconscious women. Um, one um, got six months in jail and the other 15 years in prison. And here's George Zimmerman and Marissa Alexander. George murdered a 17 year old, um, Tra Trayvon Martin, um, and he walks free. Um, this person, Marissa Alexander, fired shots, sorry about that, fired shots at her abuser. Um, I remember this case because she shot, um, the fires were shot at the ceiling. Um, she just wanted to um, uh, scare her abuser, which was her husband. No one was hurt, but she got 20 years in prison. And these things are no justice at all. And for also daily occurrences occur uh, as far as um, in social injustices um, and discrimination with medical disparities. So um, here's a, um, a 2015 article about racial bias and pain assessment, um, and which shows that uh, there's false beliefs still uh, about the biological differences between blacks and whites, blacks and whites, meaning that blacks um, have a higher pain threshold um, than whites do. And uh, this is a, um, um, a mother of two who developed preeclampsia and her complaints were not taken seriously, which led to the death of her third child. She successfully gave birth to a fourth child to help with the help of a doula. So black women are three to four times more likely to die of pregnancy related problems than white women. In fact, deaths among black women are largely driving the apparent increases in maternal deaths in the US. Sorry about this. Um, about half of all maternal deaths in the U.S. are considered preventable. The two studies I've found, um, stu two studies have found that African American women are also more likely than whites to have preventable deaths in pregnancy. While pro poverty and access to health insurance and health care explain some of this um, racial gap, they don't explain all of it. Black women are at higher risk of death even when they're well educated and they have a higher income, a fact that's confounded doctors and social scientists. So why? And I think it has a lot to do with the stress and the racism that occurs. So a lot of times um, the present day realities um, also is in the, the social injustice and all of the, um, the um, protests that are happening now, happening now. And it's just a reflection of uh, really what happened in the 60s with um, the social unrest and the cause for justice. And so we're still having it now. And I know if you haven't been living on a rock in the past year, these things are occurring now. So these are two uh, pictures from uh, different times, but it's still showing the same thing. And um, black um, parents also have to have a talk, a, a second talk with their uh, young kids, not only about the birds and the bees, but also about gun violence and also about, um, and also about, um, uh, injustice and, um, um, and acting right in front of the police. And this d has not helped um, in regards to this year with our president who has you know, helped to, um, help to um, um, keep up this, um, the, all the racism that has happened so far and all of the reasons why we're still protesting to this day. I want to talk to you about some daily, um, deadly occurrences. Um, and this is with Ahmaud Arbery, who was just jogging in a neighborhood in Georgia uh, when three men um, um, had uh, uh, um, everything to do with his killing. Um, two of them were um, son and, um, and father, and another was another neighbor who followed behind them, and he filmed it actually. And, um, and it was a tragic event. Um, Brian told investigators that Travis McMichael called Aubrey, you know, an effing N-word after shooting the jogger three times at close range, the shotgun. And again, Ahmad was just jogging in a neighborhood. Um, now, as of course, the coronavirus has caused a lot of pain and suffering um, 
This is a, the city of Detroit, uh, which is usually bustling uh, around lunchtime, but it's pretty empty um, considering what has happened so far. Um, and these things that, I apologize. I apologize for that. Um, these things have affected so many people and the, and the, the current coronavirus crisis right now um, with everyone standing in line in the grocery line and everyone trying to do what they need to do, there's also racism that persists during the pandemic. So not only have African-Americans had to deal with the pandemic itself, but also the, the racism that persists during the pandemic. And particularly, uh, we're talking about what happened with George Floyd and everyone knows um, what has happened and afterwards, um, how this um, particular incident was a really uh, a public lynching where um, eight minutes, over eight minutes and a few seconds, um, this person, this police officer, police officer was standing on his neck and killed George Floyd. Uh, the four uh, police officers that have been involved, this case is still ongoing, but it's taking a while for justice to be served. And the same that happened to Breonna Taylor, um, where her uh, she was sleeping with her um, partner in the house, and um, police came in and fired shots, and she got killed. So again, this um, all of this social unrest uh, was global. Um, these are pictures from other countries, um, like in England and also in France. So the world has been awakened because of this. There's also menacing and troubling. Um, daily occurrences that occur. Um, as you know, um, Christian Cooper um, was who was a bird watch, a bird watcher um, approached a woman, her last name also Cooper, but um, she is not, they were not related at all and asked her to leash the dog, um, put the dog on a leash. And she decided to call the police because she wanted to portray that um, she was being um, harassed at the time. Um, luckily that did not end up for uh, an arrest for him. And also this is a, just another menacing event that happened in a local Kroger where a woman decided to call uh, the police on a family in Detroit because she thought that you know, they shouldn't be stepping on the, the, the store shelves to grab some um, items to, to purchase. So next, um, we're gonna, um, I'm gonna give it over to Dr. McBride to talk about um, post-traumatic stress disorder. Awesome, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. So post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, it's really triggered by exposure to actual or uh, threatened death, serious injury, or sexual violation. Um, next. Mm -hmm. uh, the exposure uh, must result from, um, the exposure must result from one or more of the following scenarios. Directly <clears throat> experiencing uh, the traumatic event, witnesses that, uh, witnesses the traumatic uh, event in person, learns the traumatic event, um, either violent or accidental, um, experiences the firsthand and repeated or extreme exposure um, to um, aversive details of the traumatic event. Uh, the disturbance, uh, this, uh, this the disturbance regardless of its trigger causes a significant stress or impairment in the individual's social interactions, capacity to work and other important areas of functioning. Uh, this is not a psychological result um, of another medical re uh, uh, condition, um, medication or drugs or alcohol. Um, racism and discrimination definitively lead to PTSD. So untreated PTSD, <clears throat> it's triggered by exposure as we already went over. There's, there's been no treatment during slavery. There's been no treatment after emancipation. There's been no treatment during reconstruction. There's been no treatment during Jim Crow. And there's been no treatment during the civil rights movement. Thus, that leads to millions of untreated people for PTSD. Uh, next, we'll talk about epigen uh, epigenetics. And again, these are stressors, uh, stressors and coping mechanisms that have been really passed down. Next slide. So epigenetics and uh, uh, it's really important for health and conditions and it's the realization um, that social dynamics um, and environmental effects really uh, trigger um, uh, genetic issues, okay? Um, so these are some uh, factors that affect gene expression, trauma, 
stress, smoking, drug use, environmental factors, uh, prenatal environment, uh, chronological age, life experiences, and virus and bacterial exposure. And we know that there's a lot of social issues that have to um, do with this. And that's really what epigenetics is about. Next slide. Uh, so <clears throat> this leads to uh, generational consequences. A stressful lifestyle decreases the quality of life and increases um, the uh, likelihood of chronic disease and the earlier presentation of chronic disease. Um, African Americans um, are resilient, resourceful, and turn lemon into lemonades, but that doesn't necessarily mean that there aren't consequences of social, uh, associated with their daily stressful life um, due to the many instances as we've shown you today. Thank you, Dr. McBride. I'm gonna briefly talk about social determinants of health. Um, these are conditions in which people are born, grow, live, where people are born, where they grow, live, work, um, and learn and age um, that affect a wide range of health functioning and quality of life outcomes and risks. Um, again, we pointed out discrimination and racism, which falls under um, the area of um, social and community context, as well as the quality of housing, uh, which social determinants of health, um, uh, the neighborhoods that we live in and our built environment and how that affects health, health outcomes. So it affects mortality, morbidity, life expectancy, healthcare expenditures, um, health status, and, and there's um, financial limitations as well. Um, now there's a silver lining to all this. There's um, declarations of public um, as of racism as a public health crisis, um, a public health crisis across the U.S. There have been a few states and also some county um, local governments has done it, and there are some professional societies that now have really called uh, racism as a public health crisis and are really um, now serious about. Um, addressing these things. These are all the medical societies so far. I, I, this is not an exhaustive list. So the only thing that we have to do, we do have some audience questions. I don't know if we have enough time, Dr. Sapp, um, to do this. I know we have just a few more minutes left, um, but at least I, uh, we would like to ask one question. Um, Dr. McBride, would you like to take it away? Yes. So um, what are some ways that we can mitigate bias? And please provide your answers in the, um, the chat and maybe Dr. Sapp can read a couple of them to us. I can definitely do that. I was just about to ask folks to write it in the, in the chat. Thank you. Through education. Yes. Speaking education, educating ourselves, educating others on our cultures. Absolutely. Open discussions, exposing the groups to consider others, mitigate bias through ongoing reflection, right. broadening our perspectives, inviting others to lunch, understanding our own cultural lens, challenging current practices, challenging the wrongs, speak up when you see it, increase self-awareness, interact as much as possible with people who look different, we want to pause, voting, Ooh. speaking in non-confrontational manner as much as possible, speaking up for others. Right. Wonderful. These are great, fantastic wow. answers. Wonderful. Right. <laughs> I don't have anything to add to that. <laughs> I really yes. like it. Mitigate bias by intentionally placing ourselves in situations with other folks, getting to know them. Right. Oh, this is great. We're going to just ask um, another Wonderful. couple of other questions. Okay. Um, name three ways we can address medical mistrust. Now, this is a, um, something that may relate to some answers from um, number one, but is there some things that we can do in the medical world? Um, and I have, I do have some more. Uh, I mean, it was for the first question, but it seems like it goes with this question as well. Exactly. Asking questions when assumption statements seem biased. Noticing your immediate reactions and reflecting. Asking questions, oh, I, I read that one already. Build relationships. Diversity among physicians and staff. Yes. Provide opportunities for apologies to patients when something goes wrong. Enhancing cultural humility. Mm. Changing the 
training and curriculum and program. Mm. Engendering trust oftentimes comes with having cultural humility. Oh, this is great. Listen to the patient. Ooh. Yeah. Ask a medical profession professional, acknowledge the reason for distrust with the patient and be open to their responses. I love that. Affirmation oh. is key. So I completely agree. <laughs> Listening with your eyes as well as your ears. Ooh. Nice. Oh, yeah. Reviewing policies and procedures for structural racism, changing and changing them. Right, right. Respect yeah. everyone and their opinions. Mm -hmm. Being open to others' opinions and feelings. The last one that I have here is focusing on providing opportunities to increase self-examination, not just cognitive processing of information, by providers. Yes. This is a group on fire. Yes, right. I are. really like this. You know, uh, you know, one of the really important things is for physicians to realize that trust is something that's earned from your patient mm -hmm. and really taking the time to figuring out what causes their medical distrust is mm -hmm. really key. Like it is legitimately the way to gain all of your patients' trust and to really have them be a more effective and more um, uh, participant, a, a direct participant in their medical care, which is really the goal. Um, okay. So I think Dr. Daly is gonna go over the last couple slides, um, but this will really reflect those. Okay, things. before she does that, I'm gonna share some other stuff that some okay. very good nuggets here. And I am enjoying this audience. They are on fire. Right. Addressing medical mistrust, becoming involved in an ally and activist, be in healthcare to improve it, ask for clarification in real time. If we see something, say something, and being in different roles to make a difference. Check your own assumptions. Yes. Learn to partner with community, everyone to build better health for all, further follow-ups and health monitoring. Mm. Thank, oh, thank you for the webinar. You're more than welcome. Employee providing bias courses, um, courses. Ask about previous experience with medicine and doctors. Recognize that relationship building take time and requires multiple touch points. Yes. Medicine has been untrustworthy. Take it off the person. Yes. <laughs> they are on fire and I am yes. so proud. And, and I also want to say, and I know this is not my time, but I also want to say we have people from um, four other countries with us today and we want to thank them. China, yes. mainland, Germany, the Philippines, and Ukraine. So thank you for that. that is thank awesome. you all. Yes. Ooh. Oh, wow. This I'm going to go ahead and let you fire. proceed because this is your show. So go ahead and proceed. <laughs> this group is on fire. It, I, yes. really so we fun. have five more minutes. They are okay. very thought provoking. And one of the things that I want to add is I love the intellectual understanding of how important this is. But we also have to demonstrate this in our attitudes, right. our behaviors, mm -hmm. and our actions. Right. That's Absolutely. going to be the where the rubber meets the road. Right. Yes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about practical implications right quick. Um, so again, we touched on these. The first steps are, remember, the past and present events have shaped the lens of many marginalized and, and minority groups, especially African Americans. Medical mistrust is real and based on factual events of the past and present. Um, patients are vulnerable, want to be treated with respect, and they also want to be healed. So consider the whole person take into account the person's past and how it affects your care of them. That, that includes patients, colleagues, friends, strangers. Okay, medical mistrust um, and also consider medical mistrust, social determinants of health. And I want to talk about a little about, about a, mon a monopoly, um, the, the game monopoly, all right? So think of monopoly, um, racism like monopoly where you're banned from the game and providing no money like the rest of the players everyone is accumulating money and owning property you're punished for educating yourself about the game landed on their property and befriending players in the game you also have to pay a much higher interest rate to borrow money 
a partial ban is lifted. And after you're making up for your time, you're banned from buying property on Park Avenue, but also punished for landing there. But you are only allowed to buy or rent cheaper property in Baltic Avenue. And once you're settled in, someone bombs your land or creates rules to easily remove you from the house. Now you've been asked to survive as if you were playing the game from the beginning and not believe when you point out the unfairness of the game. So again, um, United States is like an old house. You may say, I have nothing to do with how this started. I have nothing to do with the sins of the past. My ancestors never attacked indigenous people. My folks never owned slaves. United States is like an old house. As a homeowner, you may not be responsible for the condition that it was, uh, that it was in when you bought it or inherited it. We are the heirs to whatever is right or wrong with it mm. and responsible for maintaining it and taking care of things when it starts mm. to break because realistically, these things don't fix themselves and will only continue to deteriorate and only get worse. Oof. So the first step, self-examination, like we said, implicit bias, microaggressions, learn about them, dismantling racism, systemic racism starts with self. Um, here are some great strategies to mitigate unconscious bad, uh, bias, both organizationally, individually, and using both methods. Uh, we just talked about this, a meaningful diversity training, leadership commitment to cultural change, self-reflection on personal biases, um, actively encounter stereotypes, mentorship and sponsorship, cultural humility and curiosity, and intentionally diversifying experiences. So these are our references. And I hope we have enough room for questions. I want to give a special thanks to the organizers, Dr. Sapp, uh, Dr. McBride. I found a new buddy now. <laughs> uh, this has been fantastic. Um, and this, um, the next webinar is December the 3rd on Thursday. And um, I want to also point out this last slide, which is um, for um, the continuing education credits. Um, Dr. Sapp, if you want to speak about that a little bit more. Wonderful. Thank you both so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to do this. Our chat box is lighting up. Um, <laughs> one of our planning committee and the person who really spearheaded this is Dr. Stacey Gallen. And she's on this um, talk today. And she has asked that if anyone is interested in interacting and want to keep this going, that we will be happy to provide a um, list and we will contact you and we are definitely interested in keeping this going. If you can advance back one slide, please. Sure, I sure. I wanna can. also take the time to thank um, both Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, Department Chair John Arnott, also Heidi Manning from the Dean um, in Colleges of Arts and Sciences, Misericordia University, Mary Triano and Jeff Pollack for serving on the planning committee with myself, Dr. McBride, Dr. Gallen, and also uh, Carly Elman from um, Geisinger Commonwealth. Dr. Um, Gallen, Stacy Gallen is from Misericordia University. And we have put this together and we're so excited. We have a fifth session that's going to take place next week on December 10th. And we wanna thank all of our previous presenters and again, if you want that continuing education credit, please make sure you sign out so that we know that you stayed until the end of the session. And we also would like for you to fill out the evaluation. We put that in the chat. I'm going to see if I can grab that again. We want to put that in the chat and um, we will definitely compile that list as Dr. Gallen has indicated. Sharon, if you can put that in the chat again, Sharon is our tech person, put the evaluation and information, the link for folks to fill out the evaluation form. We wanna make sure we get feedback on this. We also had someone say that this information should be in our history books. And as we know, it is in the history books. My, yes. my minor in um, college was African-American studies. Look at eyes on the prize videos. There's a number of videos that you can look at. Dr. Gallen, uh, would you like to say something before we close? Yeah, I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much, um, Dr. Sapp, Dr. Daly, Dr. McBride. This was such an excellent presentation um, and, and so necessary. Um, Carly, thank you so much for everything you've done to facilitate the seminar. As I said, we are more than happy. We are thrilled with the level of interaction um, from everyone who's been here today. So um, we will send a follow-up email 
to try and uh, summarize some of these points in the comments. Um, we will do whatever we can to keep this conversation going. I'm going to put my email in the chat box now. If you have any questions or requests for further information, please feel free to contact me and I will do my best to um, hook you up with the right person or the right resource. Um, but I think the really important thing is this is step one, right? Step two is what we do with this information and where we go with this information. So please feel free um, to contact me if you want to learn more. Um, and if you don't receive an email from us within the next week, again, please feel free to contact me. Thank you so much, everyone. Wonderful, wonderful job. Um, and that, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank wonderful. You.